So today we're going to talk about, this morning we're going to talk about sleep. It sounds pretty boring, but there's a lot of stuff happening while you're sleeping. And I'm going to start with a word of prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have made it possible that we have access to knowledge. Lord, may we use this knowledge, Lord, to help others and so that we can also experience better health. I pray that you will be with us, that the information will be clear. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to start with a survey. And at the top of the survey, I hope you have pens. I want you to put your age, and you just answer these questions, and I'll collect them after the end. So you're going to put your name at the top of the survey, and you're going to answer these questions. This is for me to collect information, that's one. But also, while you're answering these questions, it will help you to do an inventory of your sleep health. And the questions are average hours of sleep per night in the last seven days. What is your usual bedtime? How would you rate your quality of sleep in the past seven days? Do you feel that your mood was affected because of poor sleep or lack of sleep in the past seven days? Do you feel rested in the morning, even with eight hours of sleep? Do you have a television in your room? Do you usually watch movies in bed or your television slash computer slash phone? Okay. There is a quote in the Ministry of Healing um, by Ellen White. She's, She's been noted as one of the most prolific writers in the Smithsonian Library. And look at what she says in 1905. Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. In case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained. Unhealthful conditions should be changed, wrong habits corrected. The nature is to be assisted in her effort to expel impurities and to reestablish right conditions in the system. So disease is an effort of nature to free the system of conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. Remember that. There was an article published in the Huffington Post in 2012, and it was entitled, Man Dies After Going 11 Days Without Sleep. This man was a Chinese male, 26 years old, with no previous um, chronic illnesses, such as diabetes, hypertension. He did smoke and he did drink. Um, But he had no health issues. He went 11 days straight just watching football matches. And at the end of that, he died. Now, that sounds a little bit extreme. Most of us would not go 11 days straight without sleep. But is that possible? That over time, we've accumulated a sleep debt that we have to pay. Is it possible? Yes, it is. According to the National Sleep Foundation, they define sleep loss as a result, result, sleep loss results in an accumulation of a sleep debt that must be eventually repaid. What is important here is that your body does not forget the time that you don't sleep. You have to, it will demand that you make it up. It demands that you make it up by napping, causing you to feel sleepy. And also if you don't respond to the demands, you will pay the consequences. Even one hour of sleep loss that accumulates over several days can have powerful, significant, and negative effect on daytime performance, thinking, and mood. Let's look at some statistics. But let let me just say that sleep deprivation, some people think that it's just total sleep loss, like you don't sleep for a night. No, it's not that. In fact, sleep deprivation, you have different types. You have sleep deprivation when, you, when your sleep is fragmented. So you have some people who have sleep apnea. They wake up to catch their breath, to get that oxygen in. The sleep cycle is disrupted. So you're not progressing in the normal stages of your sleep cycle. So your sleep is not going to be as restorative. You have people who have sleep deprivation because of sleep restriction, because of work, such as the night workers. You also have those who are taking certain medications that interfere with how the melatonin is produced in your body. So, you know, sleep deprivation, it's actually very, very common, but 
you know, a lot of times we just underrate sleep. If I have something to do, you know what? Sleep can wait. I have this to do now. I have to do this now. It's not that important. But remember that your body is going to demand, it's going to demand it some way, somehow. Let's look at the prevalence of sleep deprivation in America. In 2016, the CDC did a, a survey. And they surveyed about 400, they, they handed out 400, over 400,000 surveys. And the participants were over all the states in America. And they found that over 34% of US adults are sleep deprived. What does that translate to? It translates to 83.6 million Americans being sleep deprived. And these drowsy individuals are driving on the roads, and they're working with you, and they're talking with you. And believe it or not, you are indirectly affected by somebody else who is not sleeping enough. Okay? Let's look at what, you know, what is the rate in, in teenagers, in adolescents? Do you think it's different? Do you think it's higher? Do you think it's less? Higher. Okay. Well, in 2009, the CDC found that only 31% of students, of teenagers, were getting enough sleep, right? But there was a further study done in 2016 by George Washington University, and they, they estimated 15%, only 15%. There was also another study that was done by a clinical psychologist and also a sleep specialist, Dr. Bruce, and he estimated that number to be 9%. So 9% of teenagers are getting enough sleep. So 90% are not. And why is this significant? This is significant because during the adolescence years, your prefrontal cortex, your frontal lobe, it's not, it's not, it's still developing. That's, I mean, some people say it's what, 30 years old before it's finally fin it's finished with development, 20s, high 20s. And this is where you make your important decisions, you, you know, really important decisions. Now, they have found that teenagers who are not getting enough sleep, there is an increased incidence of drug abuse, increased incidence of mental health issues, and also an increased incidence of oppositional, aggressive, and impulsive behavior. And it's not just that, they also did some studies to find out what is going on. Now, there is a, a structure in your brain called the amygdala. It's a part of the limbic system. And they found that there was increased activity in the amygdala in teenagers who didn't sleep much. So that's why, you know, in that part of the brain, that's responsible for the emotions. You're more aggressive. Teenagers who don't sleep enough, they interpret many of you know their interactions with others as threats so they're going to be more aggressive because you have to protect you know so there is a reason behind some of these behaviors so causes of sleep deprivation electronic devices and they've even done studies about this to see how electronic devices are inter inter interfering with the quality of sleep and how much sleep people get caffeine intake Alcohol consumption, many would think to drink, you know, many people drink alcohol to kind of get a lull, to go to sleep, but it actually has a paradoxic effect in the body. So at first, it will have this sedative effect, but after, it's more like a stimulant. Shift work syndrome, jet lag, restless leg syndrome, sleep apnea, and this is something that we need to pay attention to. Sleep apnea is associated with an increased risk of mortality, a 40% increased risk of mortality death, right? And sleep apnea is basically, you go through a period of sleeping where you don't breathe, you don't get oxygen, and that person will typically bring the house down when they're sleeping. Loud snoring, you will hear them stop, <clears throat> and then, you know, start breathing again. And this is very interruptive in the sleep process, okay? That's something you want to, if your spouse, if your family member, if you notice that this is how they're breathing when they're sleeping, you should encourage them to get a sleep study done um, because it is important, okay? Um, emotional disturbances. 
a lot of times people with sleep disorders, they actually, a lot of time, 40% of the time, there is an anxiety disorder or a depression, depression going on. And according to the American Sleep Medicine Academy, they found that 60% of individuals who suffer from sleep disorders tend to have depression and anxiety, like mixed mood disorders. So there is always a cause for the problem, right? Because if you take a sleeping pill, you might sleep, but you're not dealing with the issue that needs to be dealt with. Medications. Certain medications interfere with the production of melatonin. Um, popular medication that's normally prescribed for people who are hypertensives, those who suffer from anxiety, beta blockers. Beta blockers, primarily propanolol, it's normally given for those who have like anxiety. And it actually blocks a chemical that is essential for the production of melatonin. So some medications can interfere with melatonin production. There's not another big one called indomethacin. Um, that's normally given, it's a non, it's an NSAID like ibuprofen or Advil. It's in that family. And it is given normally during gout. And um, if you're having a gouty flare up. And then what, what they noticed is that if they gave people 75 milligrams of this medication, melatonin was not produced in the next six hours. That's significant. Because you're taking something to help you, but it's creating sleep issues for you, right? So let's look, this is a diagram that's very, this image is very busy about the effects of sleep deprivation. Do you see how many things, how many systems that um, sleep deprivation affects? One thing that's not on this list is death. Those who have poor sleep are at increased risk for an early death. Research has shown that. Um, so this is all the things, these are all the systems that are affected by sleep deprivation. And let's look at hypertension. There was a study done, right? Um, and they checked the, the norepinephrine, which is a hormone that's in your body. And it's essential for when you're under periods of high stress, if a dog is chasing you, you would want this to be released. Um, but look at the person. The black is the baseline. And they have two um, parameters, circadian alignment and circadian misalignment. In your body, you have a 24-hour clock. And whether or not, whatever is going on on the external, it doesn't matter what's going on on the outside. Your body has an internal clock. You know when to sleep. You know when to eat, right? So that's your circadian rhythm. And in circadian alignment, um, if you notice, the norepinephrine in the urine, yes, there is a difference with those. There's a slight decrease in the, those who have sleep restriction. They restricted sleep in this study. But look at those who have circadian misalignment. And circadian listen, misalignment is when you have deep synchronization of the circadian rhythm in your body. So the sleep-wake cycle is off. Your feeding cycle is off. It's just all over the place. So in circadian misalignment, look at the, look at the norepinephrine in the urine. That's pretty significant because norepinephrine is going to increase your heart rate. It's going to increase your blood pressure. It's going to put you in a state where you're under stress. Like you, you, your body is saying, you know what? I'm stressed. I'm under attack. So sleep deprivation, your body interprets it as this is stress. This is a stress situation, right? Let's look at this. There was a study done, and um, this study was just comparing the sleep and the body mass index. If you notice, it kind of forms like a U shape. Do you notice that the BMI, if you get less than six hours sleep, it's elevated, right? But as you get more sleep, seven, eight hours, it starts to dip right? And then if you get too much sleep, the BMI goes up too. So for those who think that, well, I'll sleep all day. No, that's not a good idea because um, 
you know, they're both, you know, BMI, elevated BMI on both extremes, okay? So you just need to get enough, okay? Is there a cancer link? Now, when there is sleep deprivation, there is a, they have found that there is an increase in your inflammatory markers, your interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. TNF-alpha, Al Shuen mentioned it in his talk yesterday, and 40 to 60% average increase in inflammatory markers in men and women. And, you know, sometimes you notice that people who don't sleep right, don't get enough sleep, they complain of a lot of pain, they're achy, they're irritable. Um, chronic inflammation may lead to DNA damage and cancer promotion. Your inflammatory markers, they, they promote certain hallmarks of cancer. Certain hallmarks of cancer are angiogenesis, the ability for the cancer to produce new blood vessels in order to, pr to get nutrients to grow, right? It has the ability to promote growth, differentiation, tissue invasion, all of these inflammatory markers. So there is a connection because chronic inflammation does promote, you know, cancer. Immunosuppression. During sleep, you, you form memories, immune response memories. And that's typically in your T, memory cells. Um, when you're exposed to a disease-causing agent, your body recognizes it, attacks it, takes care of it, but a little part of that cell remembers. And that happens during sleep. That happens during sleep. So if you're not sleeping, you are really putting yourself at risk for a lot of things. You're putting yourself at risk for the big C. You're putting yourself at risk for hypertension, diabetes, and many other things. Let's look at how sleep affects cognitive performance. Look at this. This study was done by George Washington University. And if you notice, students who slept eight to 10 hours, they perform better during the year and during finals, and as opposed to those who got zero to five hours sleep per night. For adults, this was done, a CDC did a survey um, which, with over like 150,000 people. And this was done 2013 and they were asking what, like how many times did you fall asleep while driving in the last 30 days? 4% reported that they fell asleep behind the wheel. And you can see that there's a significant difference between those who slept less than six hours and those who slept seven to nine hours. And then there is the question, do you snore? Yes, those who snored had a higher incidence of falling asleep behind the wheel. Um, microsleep. Microsleep, <laughs> has anybody ever experienced that? I have. In 2010, July, July 24, 2010, I worked a night shift and it was a busy night. But in the morning I had to go to a surprise baby shower for my friend. And I was working in New York City and um, my friend lived in Connecticut. And I just, I mean, I felt great. I could make it. Um, I was driving on the I-95. I had two more exits to go. The next thing I know, boom. And I collided with somebody. So I was in the extreme left lane. Apparently I fell asleep. And the next thing I knew, I collided with a car that was exiting. And I still thank God for that, that I collided with her. Because if I didn't, I would be in a ditch. She was the last obstacle before I went off the road. Microsleep is very, very, very real. And what happens is that as you continue to lose sleep, your body just says, you know what? I'm going to take it without permission. And that is what happens. So sometimes you just, you just go off. Your brain shuts down and says, okay, it's time to sleep. And um, this can last like five to 10 seconds. Um, look, at how, look at the statistics. 6% of all the crashes 
where the vehicle was, to was towed away, is a drowsy driver was involved. 21% of fatal crashes, a drowsy driver was involved. So this is very, it's very important. It, I mean, it's serious. It's serious. All right. This is a diagram about a sleep, the sleep-wake cycle. And for those who thought that sleep was just when I'm just not conscious, no. There's a lot going on when you're sleeping. So diagram A is the arousal diagram where all of these, you have all of these neurotransmitters being, um, the, the levels are increased and you are in an aroused state, you're awake. So in this state, you have orexin, dopamine, acetam, acet acetylcholine, serotonin, histamine, and norepinephrine. And these levels are increased and you're aroused. But all of this is still controlled by your circadian rhythm, by your circadian clock. There is a clock in your brain called the suprachiasmatic nuclei. And that kind of says, okay, it's time to wake up. These levels increase. And the diagram B is the wake, the, the sleep cycle, where all of these, these same neurotransmitters, they're suppressed. And you sleep so... This is what is going on there. There are two types of sleep. There are main two, two main distinct types of sleep. The rapid eye movement, which we will call REM, and the non-rapid eye movement, non-REM. Okay, so in non-REM, you have decreased muscle activity, and it consists of stages one to three. And REM is associated with intense brain activity. Your brain is so active, it's so alive. But in this phase, your body is almost completely paralyzed um, during that time. Let's look at what is happening during sleep. Now, on, the, on my right, this is a, a typical chart, like a sleep. Like, this is what would happen if you're sleeping. This is their different stages. Where, where you go. So as you proceed to the left, zero to eight hours, if you notice the first four hours, you spend most of your sleep in non-REM sleep, right? The second half, most of your sleep is in REM sleep. And on the, the, the left side, you have the brain waves. So this is the elect electric activity that's taking place in your brain. They correlate it to the different stages of sleep. If you notice in N3, which is your deepest stage of sleep, um, you have delta waves. Those are the slow waves. This is where you're going to have most of you. This is your most restorative sleep. This is where you have healing. This is where you have the production of the anti-aging hormone. You know, um, this, this stage of sleep is very important. In REM, you tend to have very, if you notice, you have the same waves in REM as in stage one, theta waves. Both of these waves, they help, these, these are the same waves, they help to, somehow it's associated with daydreaming, you're able to experience raw emotions, so you can be in a dream and really be in the dream, like fighting, running, um, yeah, so, that happens in REM and non-REM. And look at the hormones that are released during sleep. Growth hormone. Your growth hormone, yes, you know growth hormone is important for everybody, especially um, young children, teenagers, but it's also important for older people. We, growth hormone helps for tissue growth and repair. Growth hormone helps in, is very important in the metabolism of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. It's your, your brain also produces antidiuretic hormone, which helps, which prevents you from, from diluting your urine, right? Um, Antidiuresis. And that's produced in the night so that you don't have to get up 50 million times to pee, right? To urinate. Melatonin, which we'll talk about in a little bit oxytocin and prolactin. These are some of the hormones that are released in the body during sleep. Ghrelin, which is produced by the cells in the stomach. This is your hunger, your hunger hormone. Insulin produced in the pancreas. It helps to regulate blood glucose. Cortisol, very important. 
one of the steroids, like steroids, um, endogenous steroid. Aldosterone helps to maintain the balance between sodium and potassium, and that, that hormone is very important in those who are hypertensive. And leptin, this is your satiety hormone. It's produced by the fat cells. So it basically says, you know what? You've had enough. Don't need any more. All right. So let's look at this. There, this is a chart, A and B. The A side is the levels of leptin. And they correlated it with the amount of sleep, right? So if you sleep less than six hours, your leptin level is lower. So what's, th what's that going to do? Your ghrelin is going to go up, right? Do you see the correlation A and B? The bottom chart is ghrelin. So remember, leptin is your satiety hormone. Ghrelin is your hunger hormone. If you notice the correlation, when you have less sleep, the ghrelin is higher. Yes. Your appetite increases. You're going to eat more and your leptin is going to be lower. And then as you increase the amount of sleep, your, um, your leptin goes up. Your leptin goes up. So it's important right here. Let's look at cortisol. So your body releases cortisol. This, it gives you energy. It, it, helps, it tells the body, listen, we need glucose for the day. We need to be ready for the day, right? And there's a normal pattern. So like early in the morning, the cortisol level increases. But look at the chart on the left where you have a, a comparison between those who get enough sleep and those who don't. The darker, the darker one is, is the one where people are sleep deprived, where the individuals are sleep deprived. And you notice the cortisol level does not follow the typical pattern. It is still elevated in the night. Why do you need cortisol in the night? Because you're still up. That's why you need to go to bed. It doesn't, it, it does not follow the typical pattern. When you're not sleeping, the levels are still increased. They're still increased during times when you should be sleeping. So, and this is significant because elevation in cortisol levels, they promote the development of diabetes, insulin resistance, obesity, osteoporosis. Yep, all of that. So, what is the fix? In conventional... In, con in the conventional setting, you know, if somebody's really having a hard time, you might give them some medication. Um, one of the medications that are, are really used, well, well known for sleep is benzo, are benzodiazepines. Um, medications that come under this category are like clonopin, otherwise clonazepam, Xanax, things like that. These medications are addictive, but not only that, Medications um, in that category, they suppress REM sleep. And remember that in REM sleep, I didn't mention this before, you're, you're forming your memory is being consolidated. So if you take medications that suppress your REM sleep, your memory is going to be affected. Your decision-making ability is going to be affected. Okay. So this is the, you know, yes, you know, medication or even, you know, medication is not the best answer. Let's look at what, let's look at what natural alternatives we can use to improve our sleep. Nutrition. Now, you have some foods that are rich in tryptophan. Tryptophan is a precursor, like, before serotonin. And serotonin is the precursor for melatonin. So high tryptophan foods will eventually lead to more melatonin in your body. And some of these foods are walnuts, pumpkin seeds, spinach, soybeans, legumes, and the cruciferous family, kale, broccoli, cabbage, and cauliflower. Vitamin D helps to improve sleep. They have found that those People who suffer the insomniacs tend to have lower vitamin D levels. And you get your vitamin D. You can supplement, but...
but you can get it through sunshine, okay? And you can boost your serotonin with exposure to sunshine and a balanced meal and exercise. Exercise. Now, there was an, uh, an article that was published in a journal, and they, they did a review of several articles about the impact of exercise on sleep. And look at all these findings. And these studies were not just done one week. These, some of these studies were done for a month. Some were done for three months, six months. Um, I think the, the, the longest one was six months. And all of them showed that exercise improved sleep. Some of them, the total sleep time was decreased, how much sleep the person was getting, how long it took the person to fall asleep, decreased sleep disturbance, um, feeling more rested, increased quality of sleep, decreased tension and anxiety, and decreased depression and, and mood disturbance. And this has no side effect. Isn't that awesome? All right, let's look at what water can do. Well, our bodies are made up of mostly water, and we are losing water through speaking, breathing, using the bathroom, chemical processes that are taking place in our bodies. We need to replace that water. Um, it's estimated that about 10 to 15 liters of water is lost with all this process, right? So it's very important to replace that. Um, your brain is made up of like 85% of water. So if you're dehydrated, that can affect brain function, right? And if your brain function is affected, then your sleep is going to be likely affected. Um, there is a book called um, Your Body's Many Cries for Water. And... Um, the author um, says that dehydration does contribute to insomnia, and it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me. Hydrotherapy is one of the ways that you can help to improve your sleep. Um, sitting in a tub, a warm, warm water, like 100 degrees for like 45 minutes can improve your sleep. Okay? Um, sunshine. Important for vitamin D synthesis. It boosts your serotonin production. And how much sleep, what's the recommendation? This is from the National Sleep Foundation. So preschoolers, 10 to 13 hours recommended, not more than 14. School age children, nine to 11 hours, no more than 12. Teenagers, eight to 10 hours. And actually they even further went along and said, actually 9.5 at least, no more than 11 hours, adults. Seven to nine hours. The American Sleep, Aca Sleep um, Medicine Academy recommends at least seven hours. At least seven hours. No more than 10. And for older adults, those greater than 65, seven to eight hours, um, no less than five hours. Okay? Too much sleep is associated with psychiatric disorders and elevated BMI. So it's not permission to sleep all day. All right? The air quality is important. If you have good air quality, it takes a shorter time for you to fall asleep. Your heart rate doesn't vary as much. It's stable, right? It promotes serotonin reduction. And air quality, good air quality, you know, improves thinking, concentration, and it reduces daytime sleepiness. What about rest? Now... That's what we're talking about. We're talking about physical rest, in the form of sleep. And one of the things that you want to remember is that routine is very important because the routine is going to dis decrease the risk of having circadian misalignment. Remember, circadian misalignment is a desynchronization of that clock in your body. So it decreases that. And circadian misalignment has been documented to increase cardiovascular risk Increase your risk of stroke, heart attack, you know, hypertension, atherosclerosis, all of that. And Ellen White, in, um, Ellen White says, sleep is worth far more, better, far more before than better. It's better to sleep two hours before midnight because your body counts it as four. 
that's pretty amazing that she's um, talking about routine indirectly. Um, and we're finding out this information in 2016, and that was in 1905 that she noted that. This is just an example. This is just a, an image of, you know, to kind of correlate what I'm talking about, the circadian rhythm. So if you notice, right, you have melatonin secretion starting in the night, 9 o'clock, that's what they have there, and in your deepest sleep, 2 a.m., and at 7.30 in the morning, melatonin secretion stops, okay? And it, your body goes through this cycle. You're not aware of it, but this is what is going on. This is what is going on, all right? So let's look at this picture. So remember I told you there's a little clock in your body, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, that little green thing right there. And this is what tells you, okay, we're going to wake up now. We got to start in, increasing the hormone, the neurotransmitters, or we need to decrease it because it's time to sleep. That little purple circle is the pineal gland. That's where your melatonin is made. Let's look at melatonin release. So, the pineal gland starts releasing melatonin around 8, 9 o'clock, 9 o'clock. And it peaks like around 3, 2, 3, and then it declines. But there is something I need to let you know that in older people, if you notice the chart on the right, there is a decrease in melatonin production. Middle, in midlife, which is what, 35, right? <laughs> right? Yes. Okay. So if you notice the chart, the chart is saying that. The chart is saying that, that there is a melatonin peaks in puberty. Okay, actually it starts declining in puberty. And in the newborn, there's little melatonin production. They sleep anytime, right? They don't, you know, they start producing. And then as you get older, if you know it's like about age 10, it starts going up, it starts declining. And in older people, it's produced in really negligible amounts. Older people, don't have as much REM sleep as other people, as um, other individuals. The REM sleep is less. They also don't have, they're not in um, the deeper stages of sleep. And um, so the N3 where you have the slow waves where it's more restorative, um, the healing is going on. They don't have that. Um, it's they just... It's just documented that that is what is going Physiologically, they just don't have that. Um, also, in older individuals, there is increased, um, there is decreased glucose tolerance. Decreased, decreased glucose tolerance. There is an increase in your C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker. Um, so there are some changes that happen normally as you age, and these are some of the normal findings. But for individuals who are younger and don't sleep, their bodies actually mimic that of an older person. So you will have the, 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 the increase in ghrelin, which is your hunger hormone, You'll have the increased CRP. You're going to have the, the decreased glucose tolerance, which is going to put you at risk for diabetes, right? And insulin resistance. Um, so some of those things happen when we, you know, we mimic that if we don't sleep, even as younger people. Let's slow. Is time important? Is the time important? Yes, it is. Because in light, there is very, very, very little melatonin being produced. 
And if you put a dim light, you, you produce some melatonin. And if you wear goggles, light cover, you also produce melatonin. But if you're sleeping in a room that has a lot of light, mm, the recommendation is turn it off. Turn it off so that you can help your body to, you know, produce this melatonin. Okay? Now, as melatonin levels decrease, for, this is for women, as melatonin levels decrease, estrogen levels increase. So the less sleep that you get, you increase your lifetime exposure to estrogen. Women who work night shifts, they found that they're 60% more likely to get breast cancer. That was a study that was done. I used to work nights for years. And when I heard that, I said, Lord, please help me deliver me from this situation. And he did. He did. Benefits of melatonin. Melatonin helps to protect the heart. Some of these things, some of these benefits that are listed, it is clearly documented in the articles that they're just, they're just recording the incidents, the correlation, but they don't really understand how. They don't. So some of, they don't. But I just look at it and I say, you know, we are fearfully and wonderfully made because all of this is happening while we're sleeping. It helps to protect the heart. It has antioxidant properties. It decreases the risk of breast and prostate cancer. It promotes bone health. And one of the explanation that they gave is that it counteracts um, um, the effects of cortisol. It helps to regulate the menstrual cycle and it improves fertility. Um, females who are poor sleepers tend to have infertility issues. And um, they've noticed that correlation with the melatonin levels. And look at this. 90% of diseases originate in the mind. So you're having a sleep problem. It's not just a sleep problem. There is something behind it. And you got to dig for it. Ask the Lord to show you. There's a delicate relationship between the mind and the body. When one is affected, the other sympathizes. There was a study done among cancer patients. They didn't really discuss the outcome of these patients in this study in 2015, and they found that faith in a divine power is associated with better physical health. So that's important. You know, because if you are in a state where you're always anxious about what is going to happen to me, what am I going to do tomorrow, and you're not resting, your body interprets that as stress, and it promotes inflammatory markers. And you know what inflammatory markers do? Yes, they're good. There's a good. But if you have, if you're in an inflamed state all the time, that promotes cancer. Okay. So what are some sleep hygiene tips? Avoid caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, other chemicals that interfere with sleep. Turn your bedroom into a sleep-inducing environment. So, you know, it's not the time to engage in an emotionally charged conversation. Even though at times you can't avoid it, but be mindful of that. Um, close the blinds, close the close, Draw the curtains. Establish a soothing pre-sleep routine, whether you want to listen to something, some soft music, you know, something that helps you to relax. Don't be a nighttime clock watcher. If you can't sleep, turn the clock away from you. Pray for somebody, okay? Use the light to your advantage. Remember I told you that, you know, melatonin is produced in the dark, so turn the lights down. Nap early or not at all. You should not be napping after 5 o'clock or you're going to have trouble in the night. Lighten up on evening meals. Um, if you eat too heavy, 
that gives your stomach work. Not only that, but it push, um, the food in the stomach puts pressure on the lower sphincter in your, your esophagus, the lower sphincter that opens up into your esophagus. And then you're going to be at risk for GERD, for reflux. Um, do you want to be bothered with reflux when you're trying to get sleep? No. Mm -mm. And maintain a consistent sleep schedule. Okay. Um, remember that the one third of your life that you spend sleeping determines the quality and success of the other two thirds. Do you have any questions? Now, let me just put a disclaimer. I'm no expert on sleep medicine. I'm just excited to share what I'm learning with you, okay? All right, go ahead. No. No. <laughs> Don't turn on the light. Don't turn on the light. Leave it off. Just pray and hope that there are no surprises. And I'm so happy that Yvette mentioned... Um, getting up to use the bathroom because if you find yourself getting up like five times a night or so to use the bathroom, you should talk to somebody about getting a sleep study because nocturia, nocturia is defined as getting up more than twice a night to use the bathroom. And then we're not talking about if somebody drinks a gallon of water before going to bed. That's a different situation. But, um, what happens in somebody with sleep apnea, that actually you'll have nocturia two to four times more in a person with sleep apnea. So it's more common. And what happens is that because you're not getting the oxygen in, your, you're not breathing, the negative pressure increases in your chest cavity and it puts pressure on the heart. It causes the heart muscles to stretch. It releases a hormone which we call BNP, atrial natropeptide, something like that. And that hormone causes you to urinate. So if you find yourself getting up five, six times a night to urinate, that is something that you want to evaluate because that could be sleep apnea lurking in the background. And remember that sleep apnea is associated with increased mortality, poor control of hypertension, poor control of diabetes. And sometimes anemia too. So, yeah. So you want to be careful. Okay, so sleep studies are, ten, are usually administered by like a sleep center. Nor, you would need a referral from your primary physician or provider. And um, that's norm, the results are normally interpreted by a sleep specialist or a pulmonologist. Most of the time they, they specialize in both um, pulmonary, like lung health and, and sleep health. And um, you would go to a sleep center, or they can do it at your home too. And they would um, attach electrodes to like your brain and also your chest area. And they, they watch you, there's a video, and there is also a record of the electrical activity. And those, they, they, they correlate those findings, they, they look at those findings, they analyze it and make a diagnosis if you have sleep apnea or not. It's also about the number of times that you go through the apneic episode where you just stop breathing. They, they pay attention to that too. And then after, yeah, it's an overnight thing. Yeah, it's an overnight thing. And then if you do, if you do have sleep apnea, then you are, you, they recommend a CPAP, the machine that forces, it creates positive pressure in your lungs and so that, you know, and they also, you remember the hormone that I told you that when the heart stretches, it releases. They monitor also by using that, that hormone. They check the levels for it. Brain, it's called BNP. Yeah. Fruits or foods? Foods. Um, I'm not thinking about any foods if anybody knows, but I know caffeine is one of those things that interferes with that. Oh, yeah. To digest, okay. Yes, I didn't think about that. Yeah. Thank you, Sister Flo. What causes sleep apnea? Okay, so in your throat, you have structures there, 
And so you have your tonsils um, back here. Those are the main things that normally interfere. And in some people, they, 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 we have a score. They call it the Malin Patty score. And depending on how thick the throat is. So you look at the back of the throat. And depending on how much you can see at the back of the throat, they get a score. For some people, you can't see anything at the back. That would be a Malin Patty score of four. And that's very significant because that person, right away, they need a sleep study. So you look at the back of the throat, and depending on how many of the structures you can see, can you see the back of the throat? Can you see the tonsillar walls? Can you see the pillars? What can you see at the back? Some people, you can't see anything. And during sleep, these structures relax. And they relax, and when they close down, you, know, you, you ever hear when somebody starts, the air is moving against these structures. And when they stop breathing, they close. And you go through that apneic episode. And then your brain jolts you and says, breathe. And that's when you, you know, you're awakened out of that. And you can understand why sleep apnea causes you to have fragmented sleep. Because you're waking up so many times during the night trying to breathe. And your sleep is not consolidated. It's not going through the regular cycle. You're not moving from non-REM to REM. You're not moving in the different stages. And some people, they get... You have sleep deprivation in specific parts of the cycle. And that can be very significant because if you're constantly being deprived of your deep sleep, guess what's going to happen? You're going to have poor wound healing. You're going to age quicker. You're going to be more prone to diseases. Your memory is going to be affected also. Well, I don't have, a, there is not a documented time to say what is a, what is a cutoff time. But I personally don't drink water within like two hours of sleeping. Um, I mean, a lot of water. But also, I remember someone mentioning it before that some people who are having difficulty sleeping, they can drink a little bit of water, like a sip, and it helps them to go back to sleep. So everybody is not, you know, is not a cookie cutter kind of thing where one thing, one, you know, one fits all, you know. So, yes. Insomnia. Okay, so insomnia, the big word for those who don't sleep well. You have people who have difficulty initiating sleep and those who have difficulty maintaining sleep. Insomnia is basically the lack of or loss of sleep. Um, that's what it is. And you know, remember, we talked about some of the causes of this, you know, Emotional disturbances, jet lag, shift work syndrome, um, medications. Those are the things that can impact your quality of sleep. Um, and that's why even if you're not going to go through the commercially produced drugs, right? You're not going to go, so you're not going to take a benzodiazepine. Even if you take an herb, you still need to get to the root of the problem. You still need to get to the root of the problem. What is causing me not to sleep? There's always, always a root. Um, Dr. Mark always says the symptoms, the insomnia, the sleep disorders, you can, you can correlate them to leaves on a tree. The tree needs roots, right? So there's a root. And unless you find the cause, you will only be treating the symptoms. And if you suppress that symptom, it's going to manifest in another way. So it's very important to search. Ask God to help you. Show me what is the problem. Oh, remember we, um, the, the structures in the back of your throat, they close. It's the air, the air coming in, hitting them. So you take a deep breath and... The way, the, the way how the structure of your, um, it can also be caused by if you have swollen, swollen um, your nasal passages are inflamed, you're congested, that can, can cause it. Um, if you have post-nasal drainage, mucus in the back, it can contribute to the noise. And also the structures in the back of your throat. Remember your tonsils, the pillars, and all of that. 
the air coming, the way how you breathe it in, it affects it, and that's what makes the, no the noise. And they have noted that people who are heavier snore more. There is more incidence of sleep apnea in a person who is obese, overweight, all of that. And in fact, one of the recommendations that the pulmonologist will give you if you're overweight or obese and you have sleep apnea, one of the first recommendations is lose weight. People have pretty much resolved sleep apnea by weight loss because of the the abdominal cavity pushes up against the diaphragm and interferes with the way, the expansion of it, the movement of the diaphragm. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that you have allowed us to review some very important information about sleep. Lord, there is much improvement that needs to be made, and we cannot do it without your help. Please give us your help, Lord, so that we can do what we can to experience optimal health. Thank you for being concerned about every area of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.